today I'm having kind of a meta moment actually, because recently I shifted the podcast to have multiple co-hosts for my Friday, like buddy episodes. And the whole idea that I got that from was from a show that Mackenzie Green, who's with me today, co-hosts with Taylor Strecker, where they just have different hosts all the time or different co-hosts. So when I kind of needed to change some stuff up with my buddy episodes, I went that route. And then I, you know, was just feeling crazy and asked Mackenzie if she wanted to be on one day. And so now she's on this new co-host podcast. Heck yeah. So welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm so, honestly, I'm so excited. You have no idea. Oh my gosh. I am too. Um, a couple of things about Mackenzie. She is the VP of social for Who, What, Where and Click Brands and also the social strategist for Who, What, Where and Marie Claire. So you're all up in social media. That's the other thing we have in common. Not only books, but we're both chronically online. Yep. Um, and I love hearing your takes on everything pop culture too. So yeah. I've, basically, I've been listening to you for like a year and a half or something. Oh, and boy, wow. Like, we have a lot we could always talk about, I think. I'm I'm glad it's the year and a half because having to have been on the show now for four years, like it's a lot of time. It, you know, it's funny. I think about Taylor's show a lot like doing Drag Race um, as a huge Drag Race enthusiast. And I, I like to think of year one as like my first season where it's like, my drag's a little rough. Like, I'm sure people could see the potential there. They were like, she has something. But I'm like, people like yourself who've now gotten in like the last like two years, I'm like, okay, you've been here for the evolution. Yes, I feel you. Because mine, I started, this this has kind of been an interesting journey. It started out as Between the Lines where I just interviewed authors. So that started about four years ago. And then I made so many friends on bookstagram um but specifically one named gare and so then we did kind of like a buddy podcast and then kind of merged them all together into one into one brand here recently this yeah. year but yeah. same thing when you go look at like my first year ones like my setup doesn't look like this like everything oh is different <laughs> i don't think people understand <laughs> it is understand. there's nothing funnier than looking back at stuff like that and having like those moments of cringe like i look back now and i'm like oh you guys enjoyed that like i still have a job doing this <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah and I would get, oh my gosh, I would get so nervous before them. And I still do. Same. It's like the whole, like, you just like meet someone, you're kind of meeting them in person with video, but you're like, even if you've DM'd them, you've never like figured out yeah. if you can like talk to each other. I used to get that, so nervous. That. People think I'm kidding whenever I say I get so incredibly nervous every single time before Taylor's. I think Taylor, especially <laughs> interviews like this, I'm already nervous, but it's like, all right, it's fine. It's not my vehicle, not but crazy. that one, right. mm-hmm. I have yet to that calm down. Oh my that's God. Crazy. I'm like that's two crazy. seconds from throwing up every week. Oh my gosh. That's why. Well, at least yeah. it's not just me. Yeah. We also definitely have anxiety in common is what we've also learned. Oh boy. Yes. Oh boy. yes. <laughs> yeah. That's always fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, what I, what I had started to notice, I know you, you have kind of a book club yourself as well, Yeah. which you yeah. have to tell me more about that. Cause I was looking for like links in your social and I don't, I don't know. I know. Where so to- here's the funny part about this book club. So Mm -hmm. I obviously adore like what Reese Witherspoon has done, what like Jenna Bush Hager. And so I was looking, we were shooting a cover with Kaya Gerber and she, I was looking at her Instagram and she just would like put up a book once a month and she'd be like, Hey guys, this is the book for the month. I highly recommend you read this with me. And I was like, Oh, that's cool. I'm just going to do like a super chill, low maintenance, like once a month, just throw a book up on my IG and just like suggest people read it. Well, people didn't want low key. They still don't want low key. As low key as I make this, they're like, I don't want a nonchalant book club. So it will slowly. So it's funny you say that. I actually need to go and put all of the books from the book club in an Amazon storefront for folks. And I've even toyed with a couple of people who are like super into reading the books I suggest with like launching a broadcast channel for it. But it was always just meant to be like, hey, want to get back into reading? It's August. Read this. 
But now people yeah. are like, girl, I want a club. I want to talk about it. So I'm like, okay, the yeah. streets are demanding. I will respect. Yeah. Yeah. That's what, cause I've debated doing one and it's like, at this point, keeping up with like this with two or three episodes a week and then work seems <laughs> to be enough, but you know, me or yeah. just, listeners know me. I'm always like, let's just add something else. Like yeah. let's try something else. And, and also I'm sure you're a little bit like I am where it's like, I just enjoy reading so much that nothing is more of a bummer to me than when somebody is like, yeah, I just can't get into it. And I'm like, well, you just haven't read the right book. Like, you know, it's like the way I feel about Marvel. Whenever people are like, I don't like superhero movies. And I'm like, you just haven't watched the right one. Your boyfriend made you watch the wrong one. Like I just immediately yes. go straight to like, the issue isn't the genre. It's the fact that you haven't, you know, so it's like immediately if yeah. a woman's like, I like spicy books. I'm like, you should watch, fa you should watch the winter soldier. And they're like, yeah. why i'm like i have a movie for you if you like yeah. book talk spicy books and then they're like huh and then on the flip side of somebody's like i love bridgerton specifically season one and i'm like okay so you like smut i've got the yes. book for you or if they're like i like 24 i'm like i got the like, book for you hold hold please yes, hold. yes. yeah so the cool thing is you definitely read multiple genres like you kind of read across the board oh yeah and oh, yeah. I, it's not that I'm like, I want to be very clear. I do not look down on any genres. I, j I just wish I could lock in to more. And mostly it's like thrillers and suspense yeah. and kind of like, like I have gotten into, I don't know if you've read, did you hear about Kitty Carr? But oh like yeah. That's, oh yeah. Like that. Sometimes those like where it's like a, a saga and like deals with women's issues. That's kind of something I can normally get into, but I'm like normally in thrillers. So I'm excited to hear about your range of taste because I've seen what you post about and you kind of read a little bit of everything. Oh yeah. I'm a huge okay. believer in that. I had um, an incredible boss at Paramount when I was doing my summer MBA internship and I was working at Paramount Pictures and my boss at the time as myself and my co-intern, she was like, what's the last movie you saw? And I remember my co-intern was kind of like, she named something that was on Netflix. And I remember our boss was like, well, first of all, we work at a studio that puts out theatrical releases. And she was like, so first tip is she was like, you need to go see movies in theaters. And then she said to us like, oh, so what's the last book you guys read? And we were kind of like, oh, I don't really read books. Like at that point in my life, I was like, I don't really read. I don't do this book thing. And she said, well, what is the movie you're working on right now, Mackenzie? And I said, oh, I'm working on Fences. And she was like, is that not based on a book? play that's in book form that you could and I was like well yeah and she goes we are in the business of storytelling you guys better fall in love with story it you better go read all the books you can watch all the shows you can see the plays listen to the music and that's why a lot of times like when people tease me about like being a Broadway person or books or Marvel and all this stuff I'm like it's really it was like an assignment my boss gave me that has stuck with me ever since. Yeah, just to be this consumer and lover of all content. So that's what drew me back to books. And then it's proven to be she was totally right, because now Hollywood is constantly buying up literary IP. And so I always feel so far ahead when I'm like walking into my office at BET plus, you know, years later being like, there's a book called such a fun age. We should look at this. Is this being optioned? And then within like six hours of asking my boss that question, they were like, Lena Waithe has bought the rights to <laughs> such a fun age. And it was awesome. like, there we go. Though. Yeah. That is awesome. That's so cool. I, cause similarly, that's kind of like for a while, one of my, part of my bio was like story lover. Cause it's like, uh it's like all of the stories like that's where like i love movies we've talked about movies before we definitely both saw deadpool and wolverine on the same night and could not yeah. stop quoting it um so but i love movies i love tv shows and i love books like i just love stories and i, I think it too. even kind of translates into pop culture stuff too the same. stuff about it that i'm interested it's, is because it's story. why i think it's funny i guess like when i was in b school and mm -hmm. i remember a girl said to me she was like you're very mm -hmm. smart i'm so shocked you like housewives and i was like oh what God. are you shocked about i said this is high drama I said, if we lived in Greek and Roman times, we would be watching this drama play out in like 
a, a, a hippodrome or whatever. Like we would be watching them yes. perform a ridiculous one act play about being betrayed by a friend. I'm like, the difference yeah. now is like, it's just happening on a beach with a bunch of women from Salt Lake City, Utah. Like, just get out of here. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I know. I love it. And, it. and it's like, sometimes you need, like, it, I don't think it's bad to say it's also easy to watch. Sometimes you need something that's easy to watch. Too. Absolutely. And Ooh. I'm going to say a very I'm pretentious thing very that I don't want people to think I think I'm a genius, but... What? I'm going to say, so when Steve Jobs had that speech, I might be, but Steve Jobs had that quote about like genius is being able to connect seemingly disparate dots and make a complete story out of them. And so for me, you know, in the world of the thing that I do on Taylor's show, it's like, to me, that's kind of genius is to be able to hold like housewives, a thriller, politics, all this stuff at once and draw from all of them to create a level of like connecting the dots that go like, oh, and like, I just, I don't know. I always feel like that's a sign of being clever is when you're like, hmm, I saw this thing and I'm going to pull from over here and oh, I'd like that too. So I just, yeah, I love it for that reason too. There was something you did that with, with I think like the writer's strike. Cause you were kind of predicting something and then it did. Happen. And I was like telling my husband, I was like, Tyler, this girl who's on the Taylor Striker show, this was going to happen. I mean, it's the same as I remember the wildest episode I ever had to do is Taylor wanted me to explain the state of the union to her. And what people need to understand your listeners need to understand is I'm just from DC. I don't actually know politics. So it's always this funny thing when conversations like this start is that everybody's like, you're smart. You explain it. And I'm like, not politics smart, not poli sci, not social study. And so I basically had to explain the state of the union on the fly using housewives. And I don't think people I understand. Don't think I don't get time to prep. That happened in real time. Real time. Like she literally was like, like I don't understand the state of the union. And I was like, okay, so you have a housewives reunion. And the speaker of the house is Andy Cohen. Andy. <laughs> and it was kind of like and having to do this whole thing with her and she was like oh and it's always again connecting the dots it's like if i don't read a few non-fiction books about politics and how we got to where we are if i don't watch housewives and if i don't enjoy a little bit of satirical fiction about the state of american politics none of that makes sense in my head but in that moment i was like i think i think i can meld these i think i can connect these three dots and hand her back something yeah yeah that is the cool part about stories in general like the way that they can like you can learn about stuff not that everything in fiction is like an accurate yeah. representation but you can learn about so many things sometimes in story form yes. still too like you're well, entertained all well, of your question about um, the book club i use club, heavy quotations I, I, the sure. reason I also really wanted to do it and start sharing books with people is I'm also a firm believer in like fiction is undervalued for what it can do to get you to step out of yourself for a second and judge a character, right? So I did, I'm a huge fan of stoicism. It's a very bro douchey thing of me to say, but I took Ryan Holiday's um, lead to read course or read to lead course. And one of the big parts of that course is about fiction. I think a lot of people who took the class thought it was going to be all like, we're going to read Epictetus. We're going to, no, we were like reading banned books, reading fiction, all this stuff. And I believe in his idea that like you build your empathy muscle better through fiction. You get to step into another person's shoes, all of these pieces. And it's the, I heard Rafael Casal say it too on a podcast where he was like, it's much easier for me to get you to judge a character than it is to judge yourself. And so like when I had, um, my government means to kill me was like the June book club pick, which it's a brilliant book. I think everybody should read it. Um, yeah, it's like one of my favorite books of all time. I always say it's like the gay Forrest Gump. A lot of people would reach out and be like, because there is a fictionalized version of Fred Trump in the book that a lot of people, when they were reading it, were like, I'm getting to experience this character because in a new way, because I have now walked with this gay black man for so many chapters and to now meet this person and compare them to the other people. I'm able to step back and be like, 
that man is not good. Look. Hmm. And it was like, it's just, it's like, interesting to me what you can get somebody. It's the same thing with such a fun age. The minute I suggested that, I could have, I was like, this is the book. Like when people came to me in 2020 being like, you're very smart. What is the one book I can read to end racism? And I was like, oh, okay. I literally would hand them books like such a fun age. Cause I was like, enjoy, because they would sit with that character, the mommy blogger. And they'd be like, oh, oh God. Does she think because this girl works for her, they're friends? And I was like, and so now what does that tell us about our, you know, it's like, then people were able to step back and be like, oh my God. I have a coworker I've never truly had a substantive conversation with who's black, but I tell people she's my friend. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There was really similar. And I, and I think the comp, it was even a comp for it. There's a book, uh, while we were burning by Sarah coffee. Yes. yes. Did the same thing. Like you felt like uncomfy yeah. in the white yeah. character's perspective. Like you're reading it and you're like, Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> or it's like watching people I know now reading Yellow Face. Yellow Face. Who are, yeah. like, who are like, oh my God. Oh, or even God. just something as small as you said, Kitty Carr. Like Kitty people would come to like, me and be like, oh, I loved love Evelyn Hugo. And I was like, yeah. okay. Yes. If you like Evelyn you Hugo, like Evelyn read yes. Kitty Carr. And then I'm like, now what do you notice about these two books? And they're like, they're both set in old Hollywood. I'm like, no, they're both about women who choose to pass to make it so as you were reading didn't that seem kind of crazy to you that when given a choice that you know it's like like, you can have a better conversation about these things when you hand them somebody that they're able to look at from like a bird's eye view rather than like being in the muck because like i had to stop posting nonfiction because i remember at one point one woman was like i was looking at your stories and i suggested hood feminism to my alabama book club and i was like why would you do that oh no i was like ma'am and she was like well and then like within a month as they started she goes well uh, about 70 percent of the book club refused to read it after the first page and i was like i could have told you that wasn't the book i was like i would have told you the mothers by Britt bennett or vanishing half or like something else like i would have taken you down that route yes yeah the timing of you bringing this up is interesting because when this episode is airing, it will be right after an episode I did with um, someone named Hallie Sutton. We did a whole episode about um, empathy with books because there is, there was an NYU did a study and like showed that it does increase yeah. fiction yeah. does increase levels of empathy. And then what was interesting is they also found out uh, the ones that the genres that did it the most was thrillers and romance. Yeah. Um, so yeah. we just kind of talked about, we talked about that a lot, but then we all, we both talked about books that like, we felt like helped you gain empathy for like something different. Yeah. So this yeah. is going to be so cool that this episode <laughs> is going to be coming on the heels of well, that. Off of, so, well, off of your like empathy point, like, it's like, I never was a romance reader oh, and dude. I got into romance because 2020 20. living in Harlem, in Harlem you know, you know the world's locked down. I'm locked like. When I'm not at work, I'm like attending, you know, demonstrations that are happening right outside my door on Adam Clayton Powell. And it's like, and I would come home and I would read Jasmine Guillory romance novels. Like it was just, there was something so settling about like coming from this crazy experience where you're like screaming, don't kill people that look like me. And then you're immediately like, okay, how do I decompress from this? I'll read these fluffy, fade to dark romance novels where black women are the main character and these men are falling off. You know, it was like, and people would just be like, girl, what are you doing? And I was like, it's really fun to live in. It was like, it's fun to live in this moment and be like, okay, when we get through all of this, this is the reality that's going to await all of us out there. Love that. That's really cool. Yeah. Love that perspective. Thanks. That's awesome. Listen, yeah, I just I, and then I was going to say I was radicalized in terms of I'm looking at my insane book case because I want to make sure I got. Yeah. And then she was gone. Oh, yeah. Can we talk about thrillers Yeah, and we talk about like missing persons and all this stuff. Like that was a book that I whenever people are like, I don't know, want to not trivialize, but like this conversation around like protecting women, all this stuff. I'm always like, I'm going to give you a book that is yeah. going to hurt your soul. Less. 
Like, it never years. have I read a book that I've made me more years. like, oh, I need to, I need to go for a walk. I need to yeah. leave this room that I just experienced this story in because this was yeah. devastating. Yeah. yeah, I had one. I just read a book called Mad Woman that was a little bit similar to that, where like it's very heavy and it deals with like an adult woman who experienced domestic violence all through her childhood. So it it is, it's like really heavy, but like I had 174 highlights because it's so good. Like what it's pointing out, but then you finish and you're like, okay, maybe I can do a popcorn thriller now. Oh yeah. Oh, um, (laughs) that book grown. I don't, I can't remember the author's name, but it's like a fictionalized telling of the story of like a girl who got taken by R Kelly. So I was one of those people that was very, not like I was victim blaming, but I was very kind of like, okay, I got, you know, like, oh, wow, this is, why would people let their daughters get into this? And like, and what the book does brilliantly is it uses a character and a lot of people might not know this organization that's kind of like in Jack and Jill, which is an organization for black children who come from kind of like, I like to say they come from affluent homes and they're the token in their world, but it's a place for them to come together. It's like, over a hundred years old, all this stuff. It's a nationwide organization. And the character is kind of a Jack and Jill kid who gets sucked into this world. So all of a sudden you're already pulled out going, oh, so this isn't like some poor, desperate black girl. This is just a very talented black girl that gets approached by one of the biggest singers, producers in the world. And of course her parents would trust that this man wants to see her succeed. And then like I said, I went from like kind of judgmental. I mean, I always, it was always F. R. Kelly, but it was like, I went from very kind of like, uh, I don't know, guys, at times to immediately I was like, this is horrific. Yeah. Like, holy, wow, my God. And it was like, and all of a sudden I went from being one of those people that was like, yeah, he deserves to be in jail. We also need to talk about these parents to immediately being like, screw that. That. The focus should the just focus be these just women and these girls, because like, if like, this is the path that brought a lot of them there, not okay. Yeah, that's what my my sister in law works worked with um, a nonprofit here who helps girls who've been trafficked, like kind of helps yeah. them like adjust yeah. back into life, and she had a similar experience where there's a town in Indiana that's like way more affluent than everywhere else, but it was a white girl, but it's same concept where like when she like drove to her house to like see her, she's like, this house is like a million dollar house, which is huge in Indiana. Oh yeah. My mom's from Indiana. Yeah. 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 You know, Indiana um, enough. (laughs) Yeah. So she was having that same experience though, where she was like, it really can just happen to anyone. And you just don't realize it. But I think the the but interesting the, thing, and this is coming from somebody who loves documentaries, all this stuff, like it is yeah, a like, lot it is easier to easier. get people to step back and read a story yes. and go, oh, oh, okay, this can happen to anybody or, oh, wow. You know, it's like, it's like, it's, it's such a deep thing. And I'm sure thing, your audience is really like, is she dry? always this dry? But, uh, <laughs> sometimes, um, but like, I mean, I, <laughs> but I oftentimes like, I, oftentimes, like, I think about little fires little, everywhere. Like that is such an interesting is, book where so many people can completely understand the conversations that are happening in that book. They can have feelings about the adoptive mm-hmm. family of the girl. They have feelings about the, the family that moves there, the affluent, they can do all of that. They can do all of that. If you put that same story on the news, news? people would not be able to to have empathy and hold space for all three people and also see what all three women did wrong. We, most people would hear that on like a news thing and it would be like, this is the good team. This is the bad team. But when somehow, when you experience it in a story, you're like, huh? Okay. Same thing. It's like, we can read a war, a war novel and be like, oh my God wow and what the soul meanwhile like then we'll be like i i hate the military industrial complex and it's like yes that but also can you see how this young man had no choice in the matter of this young woman like there's so much more empathy we can express for a fictional character than we can for one another and even ourselves yeah so i'm a well who knows if i've interviewed her at the time that this is released but (laughs) 
I'm going to be interviewing Marjan Kamali about, she wrote The Lion Woman of Tehran. Um, and in the press kit that they said just ahead of time, one of the notes that she made is, I, I don't have it in front of me, Her one of her professors said, the historian will tell you what happened and historical fiction will tell you how it felt. And mm. I was like, that is bar. it. Like, That's a bar. No I like that. that. Again, <laughs> I love so that. That's when, a bar. Yeah. And so then, when I was reading her book, which is like, it's about 1950s to 1980s, where like women went from having most of the same rights as the rest of the world, and then in like 1979 to 81, just lost all of their rights. Yeah. And you do just feel it totally differently because you're like living with these two characters across their whole lives. And so you like feel yeah. how scary that would be to lose everything, especially in an election cycle. It was a little yeah. bit tricky to read. Yeah, it's yeah, it's deeply. I don't know. It's just it's I I this is gonna sound again. This will sound very pretentious, but like I <laughs> often feel I don't know. I feel bad sometimes when people don't like books because I'm like, you don't like looking at dead trees and tripping for a right? couple hours. I'm like, it's amazing. <laughs> it's so fun. You should try it. <laughs> Yes. And you get the, you get the interiority. That's like what I've heard about, like the empathy part is like, not that you don't have empathy when you watch certain movies, but you get the only, the only medium you really get interiority of a character and really could live in them is a book. Maybe, I mean, you with Joe Goldberg, like you're kind of getting his narration. Yeah. But it's like, that's kind of, but I, but I'll be honest, you actually probably hit on something. That's probably a bit of why we are deeply obsessed with that show and why people are like but but joe had good reason because you are for one of the few times in tv history getting the interior thought where you're like well he didn't think he was doing any he didn't plan on killing peach he just wanted to like keep you know it's like i think that almost is like you might have just hit on something of like that's a bit of why people are like i know he's bad but like he doesn't think he's bad because if you didn't have any of that inner monologue going you'd just be like that's a stalker that's a you guys don't see the stalker but when he's in the bushes being like beck i love you i'm doing this to protect you you're like well, he thought he was protecting her. Like, it's the same as when you're reading a book and you're like, this person's a monster. And then you're kind of like, yeah, but they weren't trying to be. Yeah. That's really common in thrillers is something I talk about. I love like plot lines yes. that are kind of, either the prologue is something where you're like, why the fuck did they do that? And then you're working up to it. But I like love stories where you're like, I don't know how this person got to this place. And then you read it and you're like, oh, I would have gotten to the same place. Oh, a million percent. Like, um, I am terrified of my own shadow. I'm afraid of everything in terms of, <laughs> like, I don't, I don't like scary movies, but I yeah. have recently fallen in love with like horror books, specifically yeah. Grady Hendrix's books. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. when I tell you it's that thing where it's like, it's not just boo, it's not just the jump scare. It's like this was the thought and this is the story behind like why these puppets are possessed and blah, blah, you know, it's like, and now the snake puppet is creeping out of the bat and you're like, what the what? Like, it just makes it a lot. I don't know. It makes it less like, I'm just here to scare the shit out of you. And it makes it more like, Oh wow. Whoa. It's kind of like why I love um, like, deeply thought not thoughtful like horror movies but like the horror movies I do like it's like there's more to it than just jump scares it's like it's poltergeist it's bad seed um I think we could technically consider the purge horror movies even though I love them so much I don't know why though those on the other hand love them go to Halloween Horror Nights just to see the purge show every year now and I'm like this is the most I'm cheering and people are horrified and I'm like murder 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 like yes but yeah it's like there's certain genres I can partake in as books over like tv yeah us that was reminding me of us that we saw in theater that one scared the shit out of me I think that's that's the the most (laughs) <laughs> but see those are like but then also this gets to my other thing about like reading and books is like there are certain screenplay writers that when yes. they 
write or playwrights who get into literature or like screenwriters who release the screenplay as like a yeah. book you can read. Those people, I'm like, writers, story. Yes. That is all it is. I'm like, dope storytellers yes. are dope story. Like Jordan Peele yes. sees a movie in his mind the same way I can see a movie when I'm reading a really well done book. Like the yeah. same thing. Like when I hear certain playwrights are like, I want to get into writing now. I'm like, this is going to be mm-hmm. amazing. I cannot wait yeah. to see what this is because you're going to have to now write out the full exterior moment that's happening would usually happen in the stage directions. Or it's like, you can read August Wilson plays as books and yeah. you're like, this is stunning. Even just to read. I don't even need to see this perform to understand yeah. what I'm seeing. Yes. Love that feeling. It's so good. You just lock in with something. Yeah. I always say one of the greatest storytelling moments I ever experienced professionally was working on fences, going to a screening and all, and it was like stuff was still getting color corrected and all this stuff and watching Viola Davis do that monologue with literally minimal stuff done to the screen and just being like, what? The same thing, the late, great Chad Bozeman, like if people want to see some acting watch ma rainey's black bottom there is a monologue that chadwick boseman has in that that like you for me it made me cry not just because the monologue was amazing i was like wow we just lost that like we'll never get to see that again and it's just but like that's good writing that's good storytelling so i kind of ran into that um with uh the quiet place movie that just came out yes. day one. Oh my god so good no i went into it like i should have known i was gonna weep because i weep in all of the like i the first one i was just like like leaving the theater so like i should have remembered that these are not just horror films like then they turned this one into like a meditation on death and wanting to live and oh, like darn all the yeah in the last 15 minutes i was just like oh i was a mess the last 15 because i just kept I mean, spoiler, no spoiler for the, but I kept being like, girl, you jumped too. And then it hit me like, oh no, she, she was in hospice. She had come to terms with dying. She had made the choice and it was like, but he didn't. So I don't want to take that choice from him. Cause I know what choice I'm making. Yes. And I've always wanted to do it on my own terms. And it was like, so, and I was just like, <laughs> I was also really concerned about the cat. Cause I was like, but then yeah, when I realized was- he, yeah. But then when I realized he had it, I was like, oh, okay. Cause I was real concerned. Yeah. I was like, girl, you going to take this like, cat down. Make me care about a cat this yeah. time. Yeah, I know. And I was like, <laughs> I don't even like cats. And I grew up with one. Yes. Yeah. It was like the moment that I realized, I don't know if you've heard Ram Dass has a quote, like we're all just walking each other home. Yeah. And it was like when they, with that scene in the bar, like it's very quiet. I I mean, everything, a lot of it's quiet. But when we got to that point, I was like, we're all just walking each other home. And I just couldn't stop crying the rest of the time. But when we talk about like writing, right? It's like, that's a screenplay where I'm like, I don't care if it's 20 pages of like a novella. I would love to see what was put on a page that Mm -hmm. elicited both Lupita Nyong'o and Joseph Quinn to be like, I can do this. Yeah. Yeah, she is stunning. Yeah. I mean, it is so much of that movie is all face. Like, yeah. You're just having to and, and, it's, and it's moments like that that make you go, oh, that person is a storyteller. Like, she yeah. can take Nikita from Black Panther. She can take a slave from 12 Years a Slave. Like, she can take anything. Yes. <laughs> she can take dead silence and yeah. give you back so much and it's just like yeah. and that's where like i i'll never not love story like and, and i'm forever so grateful to karen hermelin for saying that because it's yeah, like that's... because being able to see performances like that or like because of karen i went to see the color purple musical so like being able to see a cynthia revo tell you know it's like it's why i've picked up certain books it, you know it's like how i've fallen in love with percival ever and had read trees before American fiction happened and immediately told everybody I knew before the movie even came out I was like American fiction is going to be it because there is this writer I just discovered who like is doing the damn thing and my friends were like okay but what's the movie I said I don't even care but it's like it's such a gift to give yourself to ingest an experienced story it's like 
when I started the job I'm in now, I came into it again, a lover of content and all the ways it's given. I was like, I even said our first meeting with my boss, she was like, what's your dream? And I said, I want to make the fashion version of Hot Ones. I don't know what that is. And she was, and at the time she was kind of like the chicken wings. And I said, it's not a chicken wing eating thing. I said, it is this insane in-depth conversation where actors are put in an uncomfortable per- situation, but they're also mm-hmm. sharing in the discomfort with a stranger they just met probably five minutes ago. Like there's just such a... I don't know. I'm such a nerd for story that like I get so excited about like storytelling and content and what that is and just being like, it's all cool, guys. That's why he he's such a great interviewer. That's why yes. like those are so fun. He really does such specific like research for it. Yeah. And there's I have another podcast on my platform called Imposter Hour and it's with uh Greg and why can't I think of Liz's? Well, it's just with like Grizz and, Grizz and Leg. Oh my gosh, Liz and Greg. <laughs> I was thinking I needed their last names, but I didn't. But anyway, they were taught they, they're the gist of theirs is like talking about imposter syndrome. They're both writers, they write together, yeah. but they're talking about imposter syndrome in general, like when you're trying to create something yourself, and then also like characters who are imposters, so like yeah. cons and stuff like that. Yeah, but, I love that. Um, he told me a cool story because I was telling them, I was like, I really appreciate how vulnerable you guys are as well on this podcast. Cause like in their first episode, they're talking about like, I wrote my first manuscript on my own, like not together and nobody bought it. And he's just like talking about that feeling. So I was like, I think it's so cool that you guys are sharing that. Um, and so he brought up a story and said when they were doing hot ones, initially it was just going to be that the guest did them. And then like right before they started filming, they had this realization. They're like, no, you have to do it with them. Like it has to be a, like, we're doing this together. And he was like, so that's how we wanted to approach our podcast. And I was like, that's just brilliant. (laughs) And like, it's silly. Again, all leads back to storytelling. It's like, as a storyteller, if you were to read a story where one person is suffering, like you'd be like, oh, okay. Like you would be, have a lot of questions about the other character that's putting them through this torture. But like that comes from like a self-awareness of how will this story be received? How will this video be received if you are just putting somebody through hell? Or will it be perceived as fake because people already don't trust actors and actresses and feel like there's a level of a put on and like, and so it's like that stuff takes a self-awareness that I'm sure you guys probably talked about in the the podcast episode. It's like, it takes a self-awareness to step out of yourself, a level of empathy to be able to be like, what do I need to do right now? So somebody else ingesting this content receives what I'm really trying to get across. And that requires you to build up your empathy muscle, build up the ability to step outside of yourself. You know, it's like, you know, like you said, it's like a lot of times when people talk politics and they're like, Oh yeah. I'm like, I've driven across the country multiple times. I've driven across the country (laughs) in 2020 in the middle of lockdown. I've driven back across the country in 2020 at kind of what people wanted to be the end of lockdown. You know, it's like all of these things. And I'm like, I've driven across country in the middle of, you know, 2017 where people felt very emboldened about what they could say to my mother and I. And it's like, and I'm like, but that empathy muscle got built because you can't not kind of step back and understand a little bit of somebody's feelings in like a random town in Colorado because you're like that person is doesn't understand why the Walmart the one Walmart in their town is closed in the middle of lockdown they're like I respect and like they're coming from a place of like what there's no other food there's no other store here there's no random farmer's market that's going to pop up out. My Walmart corporate is not setting up an outdoor shopping area for me and my family. And so it's like, there's so much empathy to be built by experiencing things. And my whole thing to people is if you can't drive across country, pick up a book, step into the shoes of somebody. I'm like, because immediately you go, oh, I see how that person in that random town in Colorado I just drove past where the Walmart is closed, but LeBron James is on TV talking about white privilege. And you're like, I'm going to fight this man. What is he talking? And I was like, and it's in those moments that I'm like, I can understand where the anger is coming from. Yeah. 
now I'm going to try to help you through this. If you really are asking a question in good faith, what the F is LeBron talking about? But I also know what your anger is rooted in. And I also know the disinformation or like the false narrative you've received. And it's like, and in those moments, I'm like, so might I suggest to you, if you're open to it, you know, invisible man, uh, their eyes were watching God. Like, you know, it's like, even when I see you know, anything, like whenever people ask me and we'll get into it talking about my favorite books, but it's like when people ask me like, what's my favorite business book? I'm like, it's a fiction book that has one line in it that has been like my North Star professionally ever since the moment I read it. <laughs> but it's also my thing of like, if somebody were to say, how do I understand what you're saying? Like, how do I understand the point you're making about like black women or whatever in this country? I'm like, here's this book. Read this. Yeah. Read yeah. how silly the thought is within this book of this entire town that everything could be blamed on this one black woman. And even mm-hmm. in her death, they can't come to comprehend that maybe she wasn't the source of all their problems. And then it's kind of like you're able to go, oh, yeah. cool. So, yeah, I'm sure your audience is like, this lady likes to ramble. Sorry, guys. So that's the audience. I'm assuming that's the audience I've developed. <laughs> but, um, I actually, in that empathy episode uh, earlier, talked to the point. There's um, Kelly Garrett wrote a book called Missing White Woman. And the yes, first I've heard about this. Was so good. And the first chapter is like, you're immediately terrified because of this, this black woman is arriving at like her boyfriend's Airbnb, but she's arriving at night and she's in a city that's not her hometown. And so she's feeling like, okay, I kind of need to pay attention. So like the first chapter is really just her like walking from her car to like getting to the door (laughs) and like seeing a white woman behind her who's like just watching everything she's doing. And so you're like so nervous the whole time in this first chapter. And so all of the thrill and a decent amount of the suspense of this book is actually just that she's scared to be in a new town uh, as yeah. a black woman. Then she walks, this is in the synopsis, she walks downstairs after their like third day there and her boyfriend's not there and there's a dead white woman at the bottom. I literally, of re- I re- saw this book and I was like, yeah. I gotta read this. And then I was like oh, laughing because I was like, this is the kind of book that if I read and I post, I get at least one DM that's like, I have questions. And I'm like, I don't have answers. Read it, read the book. <laughs> Send them, I have a podcast episode with them. So if you do, yes. or with Kelly. See, so if you do, there we go. I do. It. You, you and my friend Tracy are my go-to now, like, especially that's going to happen with that. But like my friend Tracy, who does the Stacks podcast, like so often when people are like, what's this book about? I'm like, just listen, just listen to this. Yes. I'm not going to explain it well. Just go listen. Yeah. Yeah. It told, cause it reminded, um, why well, can't I think of it? The other black girl has like the epigraph yes. at the beginning is like black history is black horror. Yes. And I was just like, holy shit. And so now yes. every time I read a book that feels that way, I just keep remembering that quote over and over again. Truly. And that don't even get me started on that book. I'm like, that is a book that like, I've always trying to explain to people. I'm like, it is. I'm like, it's weird, but also there are moments of it that I'm like, okay. I am also that way about um, Luster by Raven Lalani. Like the first time I read it, I remember being like, this character is so annoying. I can't stand her. And I interviewed Tessa Thompson for work and we ended up getting into a whole conversation about books. And I said to her, you guys just option Luster. Like that character, she's pretty awful, right? And I remember Tessa was like, yeah, there've been a lot of really annoying white like protagonist of books for quite a long time and she was like I read it and I'm like there's no difference between that girl and Lena like and Lena Dunham's character and girls and it was like but the problem is we're so used to like black exceptionalism that watching this girl make just like stupid decision after stupid decision we're like that's not what you're supposed to do and she was like but that's kind of like a thing we need to embrace is like sometimes black women do dumb reckless shit too and I was like oh you're right like you said that about challengers too. And that stuck in my head. I was Truly. like, that, yeah. That was the part good- that stuck with me about that movie. Cause I kept waiting for like Tashi to be good or like give a pep talk that was going to encourage some. And then I had to sit back and be like, why do I think it's her job yeah. to make like either of these guys feel good about themselves? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> totally. It was just like, yeah. and it was, I was just like, oh my God, I'm expecting her to like be nice or focused or like 
I don't know. Or I was expecting like the character to be like very like Serena coded where she's yeah. like quiet confidence and all this stuff. And then yeah. I was just like, oh my God, you're such a bitch. And then I was like, yeah. oh wait, you're allowed to be a bitch. Like, it, yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's what, there's this interesting, it's a weird connection, but Amna Akhtar is one of my favorite authors as well. And she just posted about, so her first book is called Fashion Victim. Um, yes, I heard about then, this. Oh, it's good. And then her her next two or her next two books, the main characters are Desi women, as she Amina is as well. Yeah. When I interviewed her for Kismet the first time, she talked. She told me about Fashion Victim. Fashion Victim is a white woman as the main character, but yep. she's like a serial killer within. Yeah. Um, fashion I read college. almost Shirley Dead of hers. I got like an oh, ARC wow. of that, and I was like, Yeah, yeah. it was. Whew. Loved so, so wild but it was like yeah. you know what I love but again this is like my thing I love about books is like mm -hmm. I'm not the target like she yeah. wrote that and has terms and words in there that I had to like go look up find out yes. the pronunciation and I love that about authors now that like that like because true biz is like a perfect example of where like mm -hmm. it is a there are moments of it that I'm like you wrote this for hearing people because like there are most, but, but again, well, I mean, I'm just giving away one of my top five favorite books, but like my government means to kill me. There's <laughs> such a great point that the author makes because he heavily uses footnotes. And he was like, this book was made and written for queer people, specifically queer black men. And he was like, if you don't get the reference, go to the footnotes because I will not stop this story to explain to you what friend of Dorothy means, what good Judy means, why Donna Summer is important, why Oops. Pearl Bailey matters, like who this person was to the black gay community in the 80s. Like, I will not explain it to you because we are here telling a story to each other. And if you are not part of this community, head down to the footnotes yeah. and, and you can educate yourself on what this is about. And it's like, and it's just, yeah. I love that. Yeah, because I, yeah. I similarly, I, I do love reading books where I'm just like experiencing someone else's culture even just because like, yeah. to your point about traveling, like I'm not going to travel many places, but I yeah. can with books. Yeah. That's Secret oh, Lives of Punjabi with Widows. Amina, with Amina, she, um, she felt like she had to make her first character white because she didn't think the world was ready for a Desi woman being a serial killer. And I was like can't I'm argue with you but that's what i'm saying i'm obsessed with that like yeah. um yeah. uh the bandit queen is like a perfect example of that where it's a book that is largely about desi culture it's about the caste system in india it's about yeah. like the subjugation of what like there are i had to switch to the audiobook because i said i don't know what some of this means and but i like yeah. it i like that yeah. i'm not the target and that this yeah. was obviously not written with me in mind and i love that you know it's like yeah. there's so many books i experienced like that same you know same thing with a, another book i had once for book club which is um uh what the heck is the book called where is it on my shelf rude how dare you not be close by me book <laughs> um but it's uh it's like a book about a bunch of like really extraordinary like some are super wealthy some are not scholarship students all this stuff uh, Chinese students at like Harvard MIT like the schools in Boston and they're bought together by a very wealthy Chinese billionaire to steal back Asian antiquities from the major museums like it, it but like the thing is it's not written for me it is truly written for Chinese people about kind of like this question constantly of do these museums need to give back the antiquities that they stole through imperialism and all this stuff. But like, what's so wild is you still enjoy it. It is still like an oceans 11 style heist from beginning to end, but there are much bigger conversations happening in it. Grace Dilley. That's the author It's Grace Dilley. And I cannot remember the name of it. Who cares? Um, but, um, but it's like, it's so, I don't know. It's just, it's so it's the portrait of a thief. It is so wild to me like when people again it's that empathy muscle it's like yeah. hey I could make you sit down to watch an hour-long YouTube video about stop Asian hate and you'd be or like why museums need to give stuff back and you could probably say some of the stupidest stuff to me but like yeah. here and simultaneously your mind is blown because off of 
the author's point, I realize as I'm reading it of like, oh, these characters, this one character that is this Asian woman who's like really loud and brash and like rides a motorcycle and all this stuff. I was like, oh, this, I didn't need to see this character, but there is right now a young Chinese girl who isn't yeah. the, the stereotype who needed to see this character on the page. Yeah, the whole representation in stories yeah. is so powerful. And I'm yeah. not, I never want to sound like, oh, I'm a white person who understands <laughs> things. But when, speaking of 2020, when like a lot of that was happening and I would, even my friends here, a lot of them were being oh. asked to explain. Oh, I'm sure. And I know you did it as well. Um, and so, but then the white people around me would be like, I didn't know yeah. that like they were still scared to get in their car or like and you know what's, and- But you know what's funny about story is that you want to turn to that person and go, this is news to you. And it's like, yeah. yeah. And you're like, might I introduce you to Toni Morrison, Zora right. Neale Hurston? James yeah. Baldwin, like yeah. Octavia Butler. Like yeah. I can give you at least six authors who've been trying to tell you this whole time that, yes. you know, it's like, do you think Jordan Peele made get out just from like a place of fantasy? It's like, yes. no. Coming yes. I mean, from where I was realizing, like I don't have tons of black friends in Indiana. I mean, they exist, but what I was realizing was it had been the representation in stories was the reason yeah. like this stuff wasn't shocking me. Like, it's yeah. like I thought it was a great thing. Right. But it's like, like yeah, black it had just been like dealing with like all kinds like, of people then, I yeah. knew who had read the hate you give. Yeah. We're yes. like immediately following Trayvon Martin. We're like, why are people confused? And I was like, yeah. or they were reading yeah. the hunger games. And I remember like to this day, I have a friend who's like, <laughs> Like the most like white woman from Indiana ever. She's one of my Kappa sisters. And she goes, when I was reading the Hunger Games and they were describing Rue and Thrush, I was like, oh, they're in a like farming-ish, ta- agriculture town. Everybody's poor. And the skin is described as like amber. She was like, I immediately was like so confused when Amanda Stenberg got hate as a child. And she was like, because I read that book and I was like, oh, they're talking about the subjugation and disadvantage poor people get into across all socioeconomic brackets. She's like making a great point and I just no. disappear. Story of my life. <laughs> Listen, I know podcasting. Podcasting 101, don't you? Forget. Oh my gosh. Uh, there we go. How I feel about astrology, like I'm very open to it, but it doesn't always match me. But no. some people were like, the moon is giving you tech issues. And I'm like, no. I'm, just, no, I'm convinced now. that's why I have my anxiety attack because it was the super blue moon. Oh yeah, yeah. That's what you were saying too. Yeah. My mom was, my mom immediately went to, it's the moon. And I was like, lady, yeah. it's, I'm chemically imbalanced. And she was like, it's also the moon. I know. That's what, when you said that, it made me realize, cause I was having last week, like what I've now come to realize, like you can have emotional flashbacks that are happening in your subconscious. <laughs> yeah. You're with me. And it probably happens to me once, maybe twice a year. Like I've been through enough therapy. It doesn't happen as often, but it was totally happening. I was like waking up feeling like I, w- I wake up and I feel like I'm little yep. and young and like, how am I going to do adult things today? And you just yep. have to be, kind of tell yourself like, it'll go away if you just keep doing stuff, yeah. I guess. Well, you know, yeah, it's also so really funny. Awesome. Yeah. When you're like highly self-aware, like you just said the the magic mm-hmm. word where you're like, when I've been through therapy and I know stuff, again, things I've taught myself through reading about stoicism, which is the basis yeah. for a lot of therapeutic stuff. Like it was yes. a funny moment when I'm like honest about it. And people are like, do you think I'm like, no, no. The sheer fact that I just named all the feelings and the things yes. you're on the other side. If I got on yeah. here and, and was behaving like I was a couple days ago or feeling like I <laughs> said those things, then we yeah. could all be like, are you okay? And I'm like, the fact that I'm yeah. now on here being like, well, I was having anxiety. None of yes. those feelings were real. My panic yep. was completely unwarranted. And I had a small yep. bout of depersonalization. I'm like, guys, that is a clear indication. Your girl is fine. We are now able yes. to step back and be like, yes. that, none of that was real. I was scared for no reason. <laughs> Yeah. That's but what again, I've been speaking of story, it's like I tell everybody yeah. I know, yes. I'm like, go see Inside Out too. And I'm like, if you mm-hmm. want to understand what anxiety feels like, I'm like, that will perfectly explain it to you. And truly, at one point in my journal, I just wrote, okay, Joy, it would be great if now you could just tell anxiety to let me go. I know. And I even yeah. said it in my like calming myself down. I kept saying, 
I know you're trying to be helpful. Girl, I know you are doing the best you can. <laughs> I yes. know you are trying really hard. And you think that spending this entire weekend walking through every worst case scenario mm-hmm. that is coming on Monday is the best use of our time, but it right. is not. And I was like, and while yeah. you're at it, please stop replaying everything that could potentially be proof that you're right. So shh, go away. Yeah. You got to stop, girl. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And it is, it's, it, I, it, some of that is stoicism. Some of it is a little more, um, Buddhism as well, but like yeah. if you're able to, I, I love Pete Holmes. He just has some like yes. cool takes on spirituality. As somebody who is also very deeply Christian, but also aware that all the other religions hold a lot of validity. Yes. I love him. Yes. Like when I run across his stuff, I feel like I, I'm like, wherever Pete is on, this is where I yes. am. I'm like, what I try to explain to people are like, oh, so you you're like Christian. I'm like, okay, so I'm going to introduce you to a couple people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Make this makes sense. Yeah. And he, from, so I think it was Buddhism is like where it, where it was coming from, but I think they all have a lot in common, but he talked about like, if you can like sit there and close your eyes and like feel your big toe. Yes. <laughs> and you're like, okay. I'm glad we heard the <laughs> same thing. Cause I remember okay, once hearing nice. him talk about in Buddhism where he was like, <laughs> He was like, just put your hands down. And he was like, just feel your hands. Yeah. And that was and in yoga it, when I was it, having a full-blown panic. I just went, you know what? I'm going to get in child's pose and I'm just yeah. going to feel my forehead and my hands on the mat. And I could hear the instructor literally being like, the woman who's usually doing push-ups between chaturanga is just in child's pose, yeah. like trying to figure out where life is. And I was like, yep, yep, yeah. this is where I am. Yeah. And he, he used it. As an example of being able to be like, so even if you put all your focus in your big toe and you're like, just really aware of your big toe, um, then zoom back out and remember you're not your big toe. Like you are like all of it. Yeah. That is still to this day, something I use when I'm having overwhelming anxious thoughts. I'm able to like, be like, I am experiencing anxiety. I am not anxiety, but I am experiencing it. And even if it doesn't make it go away, it helps me just like keep living until like something shakes loose. But Absolutely. I love his yeah. approach with that. I love that. Yeah. Well, do you have time to talk about books? I know Absolutely. We've been Are you crazy? Books. That's okay. why we do stuff early well, in the morning, girls, so that we can okay. have time no. to <laughs> give gab for no reason. Uh, yeah. For the audience, I'm just talking, talking her ear off. Um, yeah, no. So you want me to go through my top five faves? Yes. Yes. Hey, okay. I, as you guys know, like typically when someone kind of first comes on, like, I know it's three. What are the books that define your reading taste? So oh man, that's kind of okay. The okay, here we go. So this is very hard. I hope the audience understands when you love books, this is incredibly hard because you love everything. So the first one that I think kind of tells who I am as a reader and what I love is um, Creativity Inc. by Ed Catmull. I read that book every single year. It's kind of the first nonfiction book I got into when I got back into reading. Um, so it's like, I don't know, it's really beautiful. It's Ed Catmull is the co-founder of Pixar. And through that, he somehow manages to tell his journey from like kid in Utah through to running Disney animation. And there's, he just tells a beautiful story, but he also weaves in like business advice. And then I would say the most standout part of the entire book is the last chapter, which is about his relationship with Steve Jobs. Wowie zowie, you want to talk about the power of story. It's like, we all know what we know about Steve. We know what his child has said about him, but there's just something really profound about like realizing through that chapter, a legacy is not something you can control, but all you can hope is like one person on this earth when you're gone remembers you fondly and like loves you. And there's just something really beautiful about that chapter. I cry every time, like I've never read it, but there's something really beautiful about like the whole world thought Steve Jobs was just an asshole full stop and here's like one person who tries to tell everybody he wasn't all bad and so i don't know i think about that a lot i get more emotional about it every year because i think about that a lot with like different leaders and business people we have and it's like how will history remember them and who will kind of hold the torch that they were a good person so 
love that. That's like my first one. I love that. That is fascinating because yeah. there is someone who yeah. probably it's loves like, the most crazy people. Here. Right? It's like I like I think to myself like I know what I think of Elon. I know how most right. of us were, but I'm like who is going to be the person that like or is there? Like that's the other part. It's like is there going yeah. to be somebody who will yeah. outlive him and like write something to like he he didn't get everything right, but here's the thing. And it's not because I'm yeah. Elon sympathizer. Please don't DM me. I call him apartheid yeah. Clyde, guys. But like, yeah. I just, it's something so fascinating. Um, well, this somewhat similar. I want to be very clear. I am not a Donald <laughs> Trump supporter. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. It's like, <laughs> when we think about the, the Theo Vaughn, yes. him on his podcast. And I saw a clip of Donald Trump just like having a conversation. Right. Like, I'd, and I realized I'd never seen it, you know? Yeah. And it was just like this weird thing where he's like asking Theo, like, because the, Theo's just an open book. And he's like, yeah. yeah, I was on cocaine for a while. And Donald Trump's like, and what did you like about it? Like, That's I'm what I'm like, saying. It's like, it's like so you're weird. almost like, yeah, it's like there's um there's this black comedian I love. And he's like a huge fan of Joe Rogan. The same thing, yeah. Patton Oswalt. I adore Patton Oswalt. And Patton Oswalt will be like, mm -hmm. I've known Joe Rogan for decades. Uh -huh. And he's like, he's he's not all bad and it's like meanwhile yeah. it's like anybody who knows Patton is like wait but I thought you were gonna be like he's and he's like no he's I like know. I have a lot of critiques and I but I'm just like that's yeah. crazy so I, I that's like yeah. that's my that's my first book um yeah. the next one I've teased so many times which is <laughs> my government means to kill me by Rashid yes. Newsom that book is that book is the book that like it made me want to start my little digital book club because I literally was like, I just need yeah. people to read this book. I just need yes. the whole world. It is brilliantly done story. I love I love the use of footnotes. Like that, truly, that is cool. it is so cool because every chapter, every single thing is like the most niche specific like commentary or moment towards like black queer people. And you're like, yeah. What? And then all of a sudden you go to the footnotes and he's fully explaining it and you're like, oh, thanks. Like, it feels like you are getting to like eavesdrop on like somebody's personal conversation. But then there's like a friend on the side who's like, hey, so that means blah, 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 blah. And you're like, oh, thank right. you so much. But it's also just so brilliantly done. It really is a black gay Forrest Gump because I have you to read this. You have to read it. There are literally characters you encounter as the character is going that you're like, oh, my God, that's Byard Rustin. Holy yeah. crap. Oh my God. That's Fred Trump. Oh my God. He, oh my God. Like, just like, it truly is Forrest Gump where you're like, oh, so you're cool. at a party with Pearl Bailey. Oh my God. You're at a party with this person. Oh my God. That's how angels in America got like, that's not how it got written, but he yeah. makes you yeah. feel like it could possibly be how this yeah. happened. It's so that's good. That's cool. It's so good. Now, this third oh my gosh, one, it takes place in Indianapolis. I just saw the synopsis. Yes, wow. that's also what made me pick it up is because my mom had a really good friend growing up that she uh -huh. and this friend, he was queer, uh, drag queen, all this stuff. His family didn't support him, but my grandmother did. And so mm -hmm. it was kind of like, well, if Phyllis is going to go off to New York, you guys can go off together. And mm -hmm. so it made me think of him as well, mm -hmm. because, you know, I never got to meet him. He died of AIDS long before I was born, mm -hmm. I think even before my parents met. But like, I oftentimes say that, like, I assume Stan is my fairy godmother a lot of times. Oh and like, God. and I think about him a lot. Um, yeah. probably even more now as I get cool. older and my mom gets older. Cause I'm like, yeah. he would have had all the stories. He would have been able yes, to like tell me even more. So yeah. So yes, I highly recommend it. Cause it does start with him leaving Indiana. And for anybody that's from Indiana or has <laughs> deep roots in Indiana, when you find yeah. stuff that involves Indiana, that was You're me like, with Kurt what? Vonnegut, Cat's Cradle. The minute he <laughs> yes. dropped like Indianapolis, I was like, this is the greatest book ever. Yes. Nothing happens here. <laughs> yeah. People are like, what? I'm like, you have to read this. It's amazing. Yeah. My third book is a little uh -huh. controversial. Oh, I know people it. hate this book whenever I say it, but it is <laughs> Chloe Benjamin's The Immortalist. Oh, I have not. When heard. I tell you people, people hate this book so much, but I love this book so deeply okay. now this is so when i got back into reading i had come back from paramount my boss had admonished us about how we needed to consume content <laughs> yeah. and i was like books and she was like and books and i was like books <laughs> and so that was around the same time that emma roberts launched bellatrist 
-hmm. And so I was reading all the Bellatrist picks and this was a Bellatrist pick that I was like, are all books like this? Because people have to understand, I grew up dyslexic. I also went to very hoity-toity private schools where you were like Mm -hmm. forced to read Jane Eyre damn near every year. I hate that book so much. Wuthering Heights. Oh my God. I wrote a whole (laughs) dissertation once my freshman year about how (laughs) Emily Bronte (laughs) is a Nepo baby. At the time, it wasn't even, what's crazy is this wasn't even a term. So at the time I wrote a whole paper about how Emily Bronte only got to where she is because of nepotism. And I remember people (laughs) were like, what? And I was like, yeah. And I turned it in my teacher. I was very proud. I was like, enjoy. You, this lady's you've been horrible. true to yourself from the beginning. I have. <laughs> like when that that audio on TikTok of like Maddie knew who she was even at a young age, that was me. I have yes. always been like 10 yes. toes down in my nonsense. But yes. I got into, but like this was the book that truly made me be like, are books like this? So it's about the gold siblings. It They are four siblings living in kind of like, I would assume like 60s, 70s, um brooklyn and mm-hmm. they go to a fortune teller who mm-hmm. tells them all the day they'll die that's how the book oh. starts oh, wow. so you don't know as you just know that each kid goes in and mm-hmm. then they come out and okay. then the book goes from there of like okay. and so what i love about the book as somebody who loves the concept of memento mori and all this stuff is seeing how mm-hmm. each of the siblings takes that news Mm. Some siblings choose to live boldly and loudly. Others choose to just constantly put themselves in danger because it's like, (laughs) I already know what I'm going to die. So who cares? Like they live in a reckless way that you're constantly kind of like, oh, okay. Others are like paranoid looking over their shoulder constantly and not able to fully be present in what they're doing. And then like others just close themselves off from the world and live such a sad existence. And Mm -hmm. what's interesting is seeing how the ones with the shortest time to live to the longest time, which one is which and how they Mm -hmm. take that information. And it's just, I don't know. It's again, it's like a great, yeah, it's a great like commentary on like mortality and what do you do with this life that you're given? And like, what would you do with that information? And it's like, every time I read it, I find myself being like, like at different, you know, that whole Epictetus quote about you never step in the same river twice. It's like every time yeah. I read it, I have like either more or less empathy for a different gold sibling, depending on where I am in life. Yeah. Where all of a sudden I'm like, well, he had a point. Or I'm like, I could see how he got to that conclusion. Or like, I could yeah. see why she would pick that as the option. So it's it's like, it's it's the, I love that book. I love it so much. What was controversial about it? Like People just people, hate it. People are just people like, just it is not it. well okay. written. And I'm like, you're dumb. And I okay. don't listen to you. I'm like, you shut your, I'm like, you shut your dirty whorish mouth. Like I lose my mind about books. That's interesting. I'm like, there's, yeah. yeah. There's one coming out from Leanne Moriarty that sounds somewhat similar. Ooh. She's her next one that comes out in September is like okay. everyone on a plane is told when they're going to die. I'm and obsessed then, with that. And then you follow them after they get off the plane. I love that so much. Um, yeah. I would say my fourth one is Amanda Montel's Word Slut. Mm. I love words. I love words. I do too. I love big words. I love figuring out how to use words differently. I love uh-huh. challenging why it's bad to say like or I love when people want to battle, is it Gen Z speak or AAVE? All of this. Is there such a thing yeah. as gay voice? All that stuff. She gets into all of those things in the book. And I am oh, that is obsessed. So cool. When I read this book, I immediately started putting together in my phone, like a list of books about linguistics, because I was like, I've yeah. got to know more. I've got mm-hmm. to know more about words. This yes. is the coolest thing I've ever experienced. So like, yeah, yeah guys read it I'm it's so good way. yeah yeah because you yeah you've t- you like always know the words that are coming in, in. Yeah. <laughs> that's another thing taylor's often asking he was like what does this even mean <laughs> yes that's always my favorite it's like the oh, way yeah. she thinks the way she thinks i'm smart it's truly fascinating <laughs> i'm like I'm like, who's going to tell everybody that I'm a dum-dum making things up in real time? Oh. Um, and then the last, the, I mean, truly. And then the <laughs> last book I love, it's um, Julie Atsuka, and mm-hmm. it's The Swimmers. 
Okay. As a former Division One swimmer, junior Olympian, you I went into everything. I literally everything. I've been a lifelong member of Overachievers Anonymous. Like, yes. I went into this book. It was recommended by a friend. I went into this uh-huh. book because rarely do things get written about swimmers. So I went into yeah. this book being like, is this a book about swimmers? I'm here to critique it. And yes. it is so much bigger than that. And I'm so uh-huh. grateful I did pick it up. It is, it's more about like a master's swim group. And you mm-hmm. get little snippets and vignettes of the stories of the people that come consistently to this shitty basement pool to swim oh, laps and why. Yeah. And then you leave the pool with one of the swimmers who also has a mother with dementia. And oh, wow. so the caregiver part of the story also oh. wrecked me because as somebody who's been yeah. in a caregiver position for a while now, mm-hmm. it's just... The book is brilliant. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's short. It's profound. It is like, yeah. it's one of those books where it's so good. Like, you know, when you read a book that's so good and you're like, this book needs to be turned into a movie immediately. Yeah. It is one of those books that is so, so good that I said, nobody mm-hmm. should ever adapt this. This will oh, never yeah. make sense in any other format than on a yeah. written page. And that's the way it should be left. And it should never be touched. And yeah. like, this should ju- this should be assigned in schools because this yes. is a really special piece of work. So yeah, those are like the five yeah. that I think say me as a reader. I mean, now of course I cut out. It was hard to do because I'm like part of me almost wanted to be like, let's pick one thriller, one smutty right. book, one mystery, one horror. But I was like, I'm gonna yeah. go with these. It's a nice yeah. little mix of it's nonfiction, fiction. You. Yeah, that sticks yeah. with me. Yeah, that's what because often we'll have different. Um, like subjects for our podcast and all of us like me included you like go through that you're like and what is the perfect criteria for me to make the perfect answer to this and like sometimes you just need to like I don't know what does your gut tell you just like find some books to talk about and I think it was really cool about this of like pulling it's like you know when you watch those criterion collection videos and people like pull movies like for the most part you can all kind of subjectively say like oh yeah you know collectively as a group be like oh yeah 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 no this movie is great because the way the director but it's like using the immortalist as a perfect example when i read that book i clearly see and hear and feel more than most people i know are seeing hearing and feeling when they read it and i think that's almost the funny thing about books is like you know, I hand you this piece of this big block of dead trees and you're not seeing the same stuff when you're tripping, yes. reading yeah. it. But I'm like, I'm seeing the whole world. You know, it's like, yes. I forever love Stephen Colbert that like when he cracks open Lord of the Rings, he mm-hmm. sees and feels everything. And it's like, yep. whoa. It's like, meanwhile, the first time I read Chain Gang All-Stars, I could feel like, cause I love idiocracy. I love mm. Gladiator. So all of a sudden I could see the entire thing. I was yes. like, I was seeing Terry Crews as President Camacho, like mm-hmm. trying to chase down and kill prisoners in, you know, the monster truck. So it's like, I don't know. Yeah. That's also the cool thing about books is everybody's tripping out a different yeah. way and seeing different things. Yeah. I remember when that first dawned on me that like the author and some authors don't even see, see things yeah. either when they're writing it. That's the yeah. crazy part. But like, in general, the author sees something and writes it. Yeah. And then they send it off. And like every single person who reads it is having sees a different it. experience in their brain yeah. because some people also don't even see things. They always feel like they're like reading words. Exactly. Which would be which I don't know. Like, yeah, I those def- people. I'm like, how, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, how are how are you living? The first time somebody yeah. said that to me when they were like, Well, I just read words because I'm always working yeah. on like reading faster. And they were like, yeah, mm-hmm. you just turned down the, and I said to somebody, oh, the big step was I had to turn down the sub vocalization. And they were like, what? And I said, mm-hmm. when you're like narrating, like you can hear yeah. it in your head when you're, and they were like, whose voice? And I was like, what do you mean? Whose voice? What do you hear when you read? They were like, nothing. I was like, right. Like, this sounds like the worst experience of my life. You hear nothing and you just see letters. You just see yes. words. And they were like, yeah. And I was like, oh God. I, I was like, I'm so glad I'm neurospicy because being right? neurotypical sounds, oh, Sounds horrible. <laughs> Sounds like the worst. Or like some people did that went all over TikTok. Some people don't have an inner monologue. Like which I'm like, who's just keeping like you company all day? 
I know. I'm like, what? what's happening in your brain, though? <laughs> I'm like, so you just walk in the store and you don't hear, like, huh, the list of things you need to get and then the conversation mm-hmm. you were just having on the phone before you walked in the store and then, like, oh, and then the high pitch sound of the yeah. fluorescent lights. <laughs> Listen, don't even get me started. My, I was just telling my mom recently, I said, when I swam, because we were talking about this idea of, like, inner monologues, I said, yeah. when I was swam, I used to scream in my head to see if my teammates could hear me. I feel and you. she was, And she was just like, what? I so used to just, sit on the couch next to my mom and think thoughts and be like, yeah. can she hear them? Yeah, I would just be in the pool and I'd be like, I wonder if everybody can hear me screaming in my head. Yes. And she was like, so you would <laughs> scream underwater? And I was like, no, I would scream oh, in, my in my mind. And she was like, what are you saying? I was like, you scream in your brain. <laughs> and she was just like, truly, she was looking at me. You could tell she is all every day. It's like, wow, 36 years later. And I still don't understand this thing that I bought onto Earth. What is this? I know. Your relationship with your mom is so cool. That's my homie. <laughs> I know. And that's who, that's, I, you know, listen. You talk with each other. I always tell parents who say, like, how do I get my kid to love reading? I'm like, let them catch you reading. Because I mm-hmm. always caught my mom reading. So, like, if yeah. anybody out there is like, how the hell do you read so much or whatever? Or how do I get yeah. the passion of reading? Like, that is my favorite topic. So I would tell anybody yeah. if they have like questions about how to read more or any of that or read fast. I'm like, slide my DMs, slide my DMs about that any day. Cause yeah. I will talk, you know, this, you unfortunately made the mistake of sliding in my DMs about books. And now here we are. Yeah. <laughs> I know beforehand I was like freaking out. And my husband was like, she didn't have to say yes. And like, <laughs> you said, you guys have talked a little bit, right? Yeah. I'm like, I mean, kind of maybe she was just being nice <laughs> no not me you listen you've heard me for a year and a half yeah. i don't have pretending to be nice in my bones neither do i <laughs> i'm with you on that one and on the screaming on the screaming portion i also saw a tiktok i don't know sometime in the last few months that was talking about like you can get the same release of a scream yeah. by doing it in your head so like okay. sometimes See? if i am Mental just dealing health. with a shitty client i'm like just scream in my head. Just, yeah. just scream in your head. And it, it yeah. works. I, I completely understood when that Japanese company told their employees during COVID lockdowns, just scream inside your heart. And I went, you know what? I can do that. And I've been doing it. And I'm yeah. glad to know we're on the same level. <laughs> right. Yeah, totally. Well, I'm so excited we got to talk. I Likewise. Love, I'm going to have to read multiple of these. Listen. My arcs are a little out of control for September, but <laughs> I, maybe it'll be a, a winter read for me. <laughs> listen, you guys in the bookstagram and book talk trenches are the real ones because y'all are yeah. like racing through books so that you can bring yeah. reviews to weirdos like me that are like, is it worth <laughs> reading? Um, so yeah, yeah. Th- thank you for your service to all of us <laughs> literary nerds. Oh, it's I love it though. I can't believe that I like get free books. Like that's still right? like- you're a lot of dream, people man. that we know when if Tyler tells them about my podcast, they're like, so like, how much is she making from it? Like what you're what like is, making? Like, I want and books. He's like um, she just loves doing it. But like <laughs> none of them can comprehend doing something you enjoy because they're Truly. all just like money is the only motivator, which money is a motivator. But yes, for them, it's all about money. And so I, I told him to start telling people. I'm like, just start telling them I get free books. Yeah, like I looked go. at my neck alley and I've gotten 200 books from Boom. neck alley in the last like three years. There we I'm go. Like, That's like two grand. You can yeah. tell my man Listen, two grand. <laughs> money is money is coming in one way or the other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I love it. I'm just always reading. Do you how you typically read a book a week too, though, right? Oh, yeah. It's like, it's usually yeah. like one to like two a lot of times. Yeah. If I'm really pushing it, it's like three. Like I'll have like the That's nonfiction, awesome. re- I know, the nonfiction <laughs> read, the fiction that I'm reading at night before yeah. bed. And then I haven't done it in a while, but I used to have this insane challenge where I would make myself read a book in the day on Sunday. Oh, I, my one of my co-hosts is like that <laughs> yeah it was just like truly it was just, and a lot of times it's reserved specifically for like incredibly popular books that yeah. I want the space and time and ability to be like I hate this I read it in a day <laughs> yes you can't tell me it's good I read we were liars in a day no pauses <laughs> no stops straight through hated every second oh. of it <laughs> that's one that I've brought up I do like it I'm one of the so many people you. you know what the problem is I figured out the twist within 
like the the first five pages. I went, I, and oh. I think now I would have. I yeah. read it like years ago. There you and go. Now yeah. that I've read thrillers, I'm like I. I immediately could've. picked it up and went. They're all dead, yeah. right? And then yeah. <laughs> going, and then at the end, I went. I was right. Yeah, I was right. I was right. I know. <laughs> and sometimes it ruins the book, and then sometimes you're okay with it because you're like, the journey there was worth it. Yeah. But if you guess the twist on that one, the journey's probably yeah. not worth Same it. Same thing with Silent Patient. I've now, ever since that book, I've taken to just writing in the margins what I think the twist yeah. is yeah. because people never believe me when I'm like, no, no, I figured it out yeah. on like page 20. And they're like, yep. no, you didn't. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, no, I did. They clearly yeah. telegraphed it. <laughs> I've been doing that too. Where I, if I think I got to it, I just like highlight the sentence yep. and like put a little note where I'm like, yep. And then I'm like, I'll be right I back. This might be where it's headed. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm so glad we got to talk. I think I said likewise. That already, but thank you I'm so much really for having bad me. At ending podcasts. <laughs> Listen, I love it because I'm also yeah. bad at ending podcasts. So thanks yeah. everybody for listening to us be weird on a podcast together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you can find links to follow Mackenzie in the show notes. So yeah. that'll be there for everyone.